Welcome to the Dash Arts Podcast, seeing the world through an artistic lens. I'm Josephine Burton, and here's Felix DeRoy. I called myself, you know, in the early days, the colonial orgasm to make the uh, white culture conscious that I am also part of their history, of their family, even though they think I am the, an outsider and illegitimate child. little more context. A year ago, writer and dramaturg Jonathan Meth told me about a project he was working on, Boom. He'd been approached by Anja Krantz in the Netherlands Performing Arts Department. Jonathan explained that Anja called him and said, There's a little bit of out-the-door money that we have to get rid of by the end of the financial year, we being the Dutch embassy in the UK. Can you think of a creative project that you might like to pitch for? not a huge amount of money, that would basically speak to uh, UK-Dutch relations and Brexit. And of course, you know, Brexit at that time, pre-pandemic, was, was, was the sort of pervasive um, cultural uh, uh, backdrop, if you like, um, and, and the kind of default political um, situation to which everyone, I suppose, wanted to refer. But for me, my experience of Brexit plus culture, and this is probably still true today, is that almost everything has been on the nose, has been about now. And I didn't want to do that. I wanted to take that possible opportunity to say, well, actually, um, rather than being a four-year story from 2016 when the referendum happened onwards, or even a 40-year story, if one wants to look at perhaps the end of the post-war social contract, Margaret Thatcher coming to power in 1979. What if we think of this as a 400-year story? And if we go back uh, to uh, a period in, in European global history, when arguably you could make a case for either the Dutch or the British being the global hegemon, in the early years of the 17th century. And that that represented a a long period of time when major influences and major trade was happening between the Netherlands and the United Kingdom. And into that space, that historical space, I then wanted to invite playwrights and theatre makers to respond in whatever way they thought they wanted to. So that rather than being forced, if you like, to dance on the pinhead that is the cultural landscape for Brexit now, it seems to me. I wanted to simply open up a much bigger time and space, which is what theatre plays with, uh, opportunity for those artists to say, fantastic, this is what I would like to do. So I'd like to think that we were, we were mindful of the need to sort of curate a broad and diverse response. This is much more like Uh, a a kind of structured bursary in a way that says um, you write what you want to write which sounds easy but of course if you've got a sort of space into off which you can work and a series of energies and people um, then I think it perhaps gives you permission as an artist in a more concrete way to explore a number of different things Um, But to do that, we needed to meet ourselves and to meet each other and to kind of go, well, what what does it mean to be Dutch? And and what does it mean to be British? Uh, And exploring some of this shared history and some of the shared colonial history, of course, as well. Jonathan and I discussed featuring the writers and their work as part of a live Dash Cafe earlier this year. Since our work in 2020 focuses on Europeans, I was keen to find a way in and a context for Boom for our projects. I started to read and to speak to people, to search for this pivotal individual who could be the focus and heart of our conversation. I spoke to the brilliant Ernestine Cornvelius, outgoing director of the Bijmer Park Theatre in Amsterdam, and the artist and curator Charles... In fact, I'll let Charles introduce himself. Landvreugd. But I know it's an impossible name to pronounce yeah. if you're not a native speaker. So, v- Longvugd. 
Land, vreu en dan gd. Land, vreugd. Land, vreugd. You were almost there. Land, vreugd. Yes, land, vreugd. That's really helpful. I'm glad I asked you. Where's the, what's the, what's the origin of the last name? Where's it from? It's, uh, my parents are from Suriname. And uh, at the end of slavery, of course, people got names. And uh, so in the Netherlands, a lot of people got, uh, in Suriname, a lot of people got, say, names of cities or places in the Netherlands. Or if they were, for instance, uh, the slave owner would re spell his name backwards. So a lot of people have those names, which are backwards spelled Dutch names. And my name means happiness of the land. Okay. Vreugd means joy. Okay. On this land. So it's joy of the land. And how do you, how do you feel about that as a last name? Um, I'm not quite sure. It's, there's, we have, I mean, I have different last names. I have different surnames. Um, but they are all um, either connected to the names that were given at the end of slavery or my Jewish slaveholder ancestors. So, you know, <laughs> it's either way. There is no, um, there is no, say, African name, so to speak. Thanks to Ernestine and Charles and others, I was introduced to the work of Felix de Roy, whom I'm ashamed to say I hadn't heard of. I returned to Jonathan with the news. On one leg, Felix de Roy is a kind of multi-talented, um, multimedia artist who born in but born in Curaçao with Surinamese and Dutch parentage, um, who came to the Netherlands before the waves of immigration in the 70s, um, who are who is uh, trained in the, in the US, prolific in his output, both as a visual artist and a sculptor, and a writer, um, and a playwright, and a filmmaker. And he was pretty much the first artist uh, in the Netherlands to... To decide, you know, who could actively decide that he was going to bring himself and his extraordinary, diverse parentage and his bicultural experiences to the stage and to his work, um, and it was extremely radical. I mean, it still is completely extremely radical in some ways to do that, but he really was out on. He was really um, a pioneer, an avant-garde artist in that way, in that time, in the seven, in the seventies and the eighties. Still doing, still now making work, still incredibly as political and active and excited about the world as he ever was. Along with Ms. Plans in 2020, we cancelled our Live Dash Cafe on Felix earlier in the year. However, I have managed to spend some magical time with Felix over lockdown. Through this podcast, you'll be able to hear from him directly and those who work with him and hear from some of the seven playwrights working on Boom today as I discover Felix and his work and discuss the ongoing post-colonial legacy of race and its role in shaping Dutch culture. I began by asking Felix what he's been up to during lockdown. I'm trying to get a new uh, how is it, interest from the World Museum in Rotterdam to do something again with a Negrophilia collection. I said, well, in this time of kickouts, Black Pete and Black Lives Matter, I think it's very important because it was uh, 30 years ago or, or yeah, 30 years ago that the exhibition was there and there's a whole new generation with a different set of consciousness who I think should see this collection to put the whole question of uh, image forming in the, in, in the, uh, from the Western white perspective uh, to have that, that, that information. Yeah, to know that it goes very deep and it's very varied in its expressions. Can you um, take me back like 30 plus years and tell me how, how, it, how it came to happen? Well, it actually came to uh, happen uh, through my friend, uh, the late um, actor, uh, director Rufus Collins, who I met in, uh, in London when we, were, uh, we premiered uh, Desiree, the play there in the old Red Lion. And... He came to Holland to set up an, uh, an educational program for actors. And when I went to visit him in his apartment in Amsterdam, I was amazed to see, you know, all these images of black peat and uh, little niggers and shoe polish 
uh, bottles and, 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 and coffee tin cans and chocolates and God knows what with images of black people on it. And I asked him, why do you surround yourself with the terrible kitsch? And they explained to me, like, listen, this is really popular culture. And it's very important for my students to know that they should not be uh, uh, pinned down and st playing stereotypes. They should, should go against the stereotypes. And I, as a, uh, a, a visual artist and, you know, uh, more interested in what they uh, say is high art, I was like, oh, my God, you know, I re never really realized uh, uh, the importance of it. And so I started collecting and I really went wild. It was like a, a fever had gotten hold of me. And um, also in that period, I had to do a lot of uh, film festivals all over the world, you know, with uh, Ava and Gabriel, who had just come out in that film. And so everywhere I went, uh, instead of like going to see a lot of the films in the program, I went on scouting to find the images of blacks in all these different countries. And so the collection became very uh, international. And I think that's also one of the very important aspects because in the USA, they have like the uh, black, what they call the black memorabilia. And in, uh, uh, in France, they did a big exhibition about uh, 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 Le Negre dans l'art de la publicité, but it was all um, locally you know, all, all about French. And, uh, and so I, I tried to uh, make it uh, really international. For me, that was very important. All inclusive, all the countries that had participated in one form or the other in colonialism were targeted. And then you convinced the, the museum in Rotterdam to, to, to yes, take it. That, no, well, there was a museum in Amsterdam. So I went there and I already had collected, I mean, everything that I earned, you know, as an artist, I collected. Uh, and I had quite an impressive collection. So I invited them over to uh, uh, the storage room and they were like totally flabbergasted. And then they said like, OK, we want to do this. Um, uh, but you have to uh, get someone who will do, uh, how you say it, or someone with a university degree who can uh, really talk about this collection because you are not an, uh, a curator, you are just an, 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 an artist and a madman. Well, they didn't say the madman. But uh, so then I got uh, Jan Nedervin Pietersen to uh, uh, write the catalog. Right. And it was very, very... Uh, 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 successful for the Tropen Museum. It was this still till now the exhibition that gave them the most uh, international publicity. I mean, people cr and crews came all from all over, and then it traveled to it went to uh, uh, Brussels in Belgium, and it went to uh, it returned to uh, the Netherlands, and it also went to uh, Copenhagen, the National Museum there. Have you been continuing to collect the work over the last 30 years? It's a, it's a disease. <laughs> These stereotype representations that are still being created around the world, are they changing? I mean, do you see more nuanced representation now? Yeah, I must say, I think it's really changing because uh, the consciousness is changing. I mean, uh, you, you can't do an uh, and Jemima anymore. You can't do it. Uncle Ben's rice anymore. You can't do the gollywogs anymore. You can't do the negra banania anymore. The sarotti more is also uh, not being used. And there's a lot of things against Swarta Pete now also. So I do think it's changing. And in the imagery, it's becoming, uh, especially on, on in, in, in television commercials, I see that it's getting much and much more inclusive. This is a good moment to introduce you to one of the boom playwrights, Nesca Bex, who saw the exhibition. Jonathan gives a little intro. Nesca Bex, who is originally from Senegal, uh, has lived in Brussels, also in the Netherlands, but is currently, for the last three or four years, based in Mallorca. Is a writer, but also documentary filmmaker, theatre maker, um, and she uh, has decided to concentrate on a story that investigates her own family history 
in relationship to the name of battle. And taking this notion of battle as a name, starting to explore, well, how did that happen? That exploration, not surprisingly, also takes in a, a range of different places, of course, including battle uh, on the south coast of England. Um, and she's using it as a way, I think, of, of traversing the continents between Europe, West Africa, uh, uh, the Caribbean, um, and the United States. Not surprisingly, uh, it's also those routes that were the Atlantic slave trade. And she's exploring in a very non-naturalistic way some of the resonances that that, that, that name has, as it were, as it ripples outwards. I asked Nesca about Felix. Do you have a kind of uh, personal relationship with him? Do you have a relationship with his work? Oh, yeah, of course I have. Oh, it's, it's nice to tell because I even wrote about it a few months ago that um, it must have been 93 or 94 or something last century that I saw the exhibition White, Wit over Zwart, White about Black. And I was very young at the time and, and not decolonized at all. And I remember where I was and how I looked at it. And that, that was the first time I actually heard about Felix. So it's also very important, I think, for these institutions to, to open their door for, for young people from different backgrounds and of course not only opening the door but also showing them people that look like them that make work that 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 refers to them and that is what Felix did I was 21 or 22 when I saw that exposition exhibition and it made you and it and it, and it inspired you it was part of your it was part shocked of your journey me. shocked you. me <laughs> It shocked me, but I never forgot about it, you know, it, because it was white about black. So it showed all the kind of images that what white people made and told and showed about black people. So it was yeah. not inspiring. It was shocking. Yeah. It was painful, but it was, it, it, I never forgot it. Charles also chatted about the exhibition. 1989, nobody in the Netherlands was thinking about these things. Nobody. Felix is the original artist curator in the Dutch context. Um, and as you will see now, there's hardly any black curators. We only have two now since the past three years. And there's a lot of, there's artist curators, but no curators. So he is the original one who as an, was working as an artist and was curating exhibitions at the same time um, to change the environment in which the artist could flourish or, you know, find a place. Mm. It drew a lot of attention in the Netherlands. It was taking place at the same time as Mag Magicien de la Terre, you know, in France. So it was a very important exhibition. It drew a lot, a lot, a lot of uh, crowd. And at that point already, you know, he was addressing the idea of Black Pete and that Black Pete is gollywog and gollywog is racist. And then the Minister of Culture then was like, okay, all of this is racist, but not Black Pete. And now it's 2020 and we are still fighting Black Pete. But we are, it seems like we're gonna, you know, it's gonna change. The situation is gonna change. In every conversation, the topic of Black Pete, Schwarte Pete, came up as a visible symbol or emblem of colonial history and slavery in the Netherlands. Felix worked with Ernestine Convalius in the late 90s on a theatre show, The Shadow of the Good Holy Man. I asked Ernestine about this show working with Felix and Black Pete. We were about the first who made a theatre play about Black Pete. And uh, that's... Wow. that's but he, he um, directed it. We, we couldn't find a lot of money to, to produce it because the, <laughs> the foundations, the, fund, the funds, they were, they were a little bit offended. 
It was not like now. Now everybody would give us tons of thousands to make it, I think. But back then it was, and then I'm talking about um, 85, 88, uh, 90, 95, 98. It was uh, developed like a little bit more than a hundred years ago by, uh, uh, I think, van der Schenk, Schenkman, a Dutch writer who invented it. But he invented it in a time where um, there was still slavery. And uh, so he invented the, the, the image of Black Pete is, is the image that they had of Black people. But the story they always told was, well, he, he comes through the chimney in the house and, um, and, and that's why he has become black. But at the same time, his lips became red and they became very big. His earrings were, you know, uh, strange. His hair became curly like black people's hair. They could never explain that. But uh, so, and the other thing was the way he was, he would talk. He couldn't speak Dutch in a proper way. He would have a strong accent. So it was quite clear that uh, <laughs> um, they were making, um, how do you say it? Um, stereotypes, racist stereotypes. That's the word I was looking for. They were making a stereotype of black people. And um, so that's one thing. The other thing is that many Dutch people, I must say, they don't know their own history, especially, you know, it, it's only recent, the last 20 years, that there are more discussions about the history. There are enough people who don't even realize that they would be slave, that there has ever been slavery. And, uh, and many are also not... Um, discussing what is happening in the world. So like in America with blackface or in, in the UK with blackface. So all these discussions and these developments, they were not part of the discussion in the Netherlands. And yeah. to me, it was very interesting to, to study, uh, no, to understand what makes it so important to them, the black peep. Yeah. Why do they need a black peep? And so when we made our play, we also had discussions afterwards. And that's what I, when I discovered from really white people whom I knew, who were quite progressive, but at the moment we would talk about Black Pete, they became emotional because they took it personal. And, and not just personal because they are white, no, because it's about their childhood memory. And, and, and we were really making an ugly the childhood memory, which, wow. uh, the, the, yes, the whole atmosphere for them was, you know, the, the excitement, they would drink chocolate, uh, the whole family would be together. So it was as if you were attacking that part which they loved. So it was a very strange thing. At a, at a certain moment, I thought, but we are... Um, we are mature people talking now, but all of a sudden I was talking to a child. Wow, so interesting. And how did, do you think that, do you, do you, did you feel that things changed as a result of that work that you did with Felix? Enormously things have changed and that, and things have changed because uh, three years ago, uh, about three years ago, I think, uh, the young people who um, were like in their 20s, they, they wouldn't accept it anymore. Like my generation, even though we protested, Black Pete was not a target of ours. It was like something you had to get, you know, you had to live with. And um, I, I, I think we, we didn't think that would change that fast. But our children are born here and they, they, became, they are in their 20s now. And they had a different attitude. So the only thing they did is they started to wear a Black Pete is Racism t-shirt. And they, they went to, uh, you know, when, when the, the Santa Claus comes with his, all his Black Pete's with the boat, etc. They went to this parade and they stood there. That was all they did. But there wow. were 
they were beaten by the police. They were, it, it was very heavy. And because of that reaction, uh, they decided, well, then we will be there every year because we will show them that Black Pete is racist. We're not doing anything else. We're going to stand there with our T-shirts. And that's when the confrontation became really ugly. It started to become, even, even we, because of our theater play, we got death threats, you know, death threats because of a theater play about Black Pete. And, and now uh, they, they had done some research and uh, by now about 70% of the people think that Black Pete should change. But there's a hardcore defending themselves and doing all kinds of ugly things. And um, so it's, it's like a, a, a chain of change now. The, the premier has, uh, Rutte, the, the Dutch premier, he has invited the movement uh, and, and they have uh, the delegation spoke to him uh, about this. And which is also very special because like a year ago, he would say, Black Pete is not racist. You know, it's just somebody who, who's black. And he even made jokes about, well, in the Antilles, my friends say, uh, it doesn't matter. They don't have to schmink because they're already black. Now, these backward things that the highest person of the government would say, and now after a year, after these, um, also after the Black Lives Matter movement, I must say that the Black Lives Matter movement has also accelerated things. Mm -hmm. And uh, so now he wants to talk and he wants to listen. Uh, and so I think, yeah. That's very interesting. It's the mainstream can't close, they can't close their eyes anymore. I chatted to Jude Christian and Gable Rolofsen about Black Pete. The two of them are collaborating on a shared work for Boom. Before moving on to Black Pete, we discussed how they first met. Did you two meet on this project on Boom or do you know each other already? We knew each other already. We, um, we met about four, five, four years ago, um, five years ago in Aix-en-Provence. Um, yes, we were very posh. We were at the, with the opera. We were, yeah, yeah. Uh, just hanging out at an opera festival, bonding. Um, and then we stayed in touch and we've, uh, we've visited each other and, and seen lots of each other's work and sort of talked endlessly about ways that we want to work together. And then I think, Gable, you found the call out for this. Um, and then we, we decided to put in a joint application. Yeah, which, which was a no-brainer because... <laughs> We both uh, have um, Chinese uh, Asian heritage uh, right. in our colonial history, so it was a sort of no-brainer uh, that we, at some point, should create something together. It's like finding another version of yourself really unexpectedly in a, in a kind of needle in a haystack way. Gable explained that they're writing a piece of work together remotely through lockdown. But I would love to see how it works out when we speak it out loud together. Yeah, mm. And if we can both respect the sort of Dutch experience of the colonial history and its own resistances to, to relive it or reflect upon it and a very particular British uh, way of uh, having with its own distance to it or, or its own resistances to it. And can we speak it, both our texts in the same space and do they, how do they work together? I'm very excited to go into that part of the process now. People, people bring up Black Pete a lot as, as part of the, what they represent as change. It's change happens slowly, but it's happening. Um, and he's part of that change or part of helping to make it. I mean, obviously, he's just a part of it. Um, would, you, would you also reference Black Pete as part of a cultural shift that you feel is happening over the last 30, 40 years? I think Black Pete is... Um representative of the unwillingness to see or um, to see other people's perspective or other people's experience. So the whole idea of Black Pete is Dutch tradition and don't touch our tradition is sort of a battleground for people who want to keep race relations um, and 
white dominance um, or the historic race relationship in its place. Felix de Roy has started its conversation, tried to start this conversation in the 80s by making a, um, um, an exposition in the, in, the tropo- in the Tropical Art Institute in Amsterdam. And then the culture was not ready to have that conversation. Um, but he was way ahead of his time to use Black P to start conversation about race relationship in, gen- uh, in general in the Netherlands. We are moving ahead, but also seeing race relations for what they really are and what they have been. So it's also a sickening moment in time sometimes. I would agree. I think um, that essentially that uh, I'm trying to work out if this is a really rubbish analogy, but if you imagine that there's a football match where it, it seems inevitable that one side is going to lose, arguably they will fight the hardest in the final five minutes to prevent it happening. And I think there's a real, um, there is a, a real violence um, that we're seeing unleashed in this country because it feels like the more, of a general move there is towards a desire for equality and also for this country to grapple with the realities of its colonial history, the more violently you're seeing people come out against that. And I think those, um, it's really fascinating and really horrible to watch battleground. Um, for example, it's, it's not quite an equivalent, but coming back to something like the singing of Land of Hope and Glory at the Proms, I find it fascinating, partly because the whole thing was this sort of manufactured myth where um, uh, allegedly um, the suggestion to cut the singing of the song was 100% to do with coronavirus. And I mean, I'm making a show at the moment where you're like, yeah, what you can't have is your entire audience just like singing in a room. Um, it, but it became a thing of woke BBC is cancelling beloved national song. You then get Nigel Farage singing. You just basically get tons and tons of um, white nationalists proving that they don't even know the lyrics to the song by belting it out as loud as they can. You have Jacob rees all playing it in Parliament. And I think what's fascinating about it as a technique um, is that the way of couching it is, oh, it's just a song. Like, it's just a simple song. And these simple pleasures are being taken from us. Um viciously sort of ripped from us by um, woke campaigners who are determined to destroy every last bit of fun about being British. Um, And you kind of, you want to just look at it and grab them and be like, if it's just a song, like if it's just a bit of fun, then how sad would it make you to not sing it anymore? Like, but it's simultaneously people have the ability to make something um, monolithic and inconsequential. And therefore I think it becomes a really, really effective weapon um, because it, it allows uh, people with that agenda to propagate this fear amongst white British communities that every last innocent thing is going to be taken from them. Um, rather than <laughs> rather than having the sense of proportion that goes, look, the lyrics of this are obviously deeply problematic. Um, what like if it's if it's not that big a deal what would it cost you to substitute this with something else and why wouldn't you take joy in finding something that you can sing that everyone in that room can sing and feel happy about i'd like to take us right back to felix de roy's beginnings in curacao i'm born from uh, intellectual surinamese parents who were uh, uh, immigrants and a, and a young age my father at, at especially and uh, so I'm like for Curacao I am like Curacaoan but not 100% because you know my I have, have Surinamese roots and Suriname it was like okay I have Surinamese parents but I'm born on Curacao you know raised in, on the island so you know that makes me a dubious Thing. And then I went to Mexico to study at the um, American high school. And there I suddenly became the first time they called me a nigger. You know, for me, it was like, what are you talking about? <laughs> you know? Um, so, and by that time, it was the fifth time, Josephine, that I had to sing a national hymn. I knew the national hymn of the Netherlands. I knew the national hymn of Curacao. I knew the national hymn of Suriname. I knew the national hymn of Mexico because I went to a, first to an all Spanish speaking Mexican school before I went to the American high school. Then I had to do the, uh, the, the American hymn. And then I said to myself, Felix, there was a moment of like, 
revelation. I said, like, these people are totally all crazy because, you know, just a few miles down the block, there is another nation who thinks that they are the best. So, I mean, this is absolutely mm. ridiculous. What it has to do with identity? You know, do you have to hang up your identity on the national hymn? So you always that exp- you've always felt like uh, you're on the outside. You know, you've always felt like you're, you're you can see you can, you have the distance. You've always had that perspective. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I see myself also as like the intimate outsider because I'm very intimate with all these cultures that I've been living in. It was a very intimate relationship. But also, on the other hand, I'm an outsider. So the intimate outsider. I've been fed with a lot of uh, European culture. And, and, and uh, yeah, and images and references. But of course, by having lived not only in Europe, but also in the Caribbean and in Mexico, which was very important for me to see the, 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 the enormous wealth of the Latin American continent in uh, culturally speaking, you know, uh, uh, so it could put every, it did put everything in a perspective because when I, uh, after Mexico, when I came to Holland to study at the art school, I went to the Dumb Square in Amsterdam, and I was like, oh, is this it? Compared with the squares in Mexico City, <laughs> you know, this is a village square, you know, so I didn't have the um, uh, colonized perspective on Europe when I arrived. I had a lot of other uh, references. So I was never really intimidated by Europe. Did you feel that people were expecting you to be more intimidated than you felt? Yes, of course. Yeah, 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 yeah. But that was their problem, not mine. Right. I had like a kind of, uh, how you call it, intellectual arrogance towards the people who I considered were less informed as I was. Yeah. But presumably that this arrogance that you said you the, that you said you brought with you or this this insight that you had it, it it enabled you to forge your own artistic path in the Netherlands didn't it it made that you could you could say what you could say without feeling uh restricted Restricted, yeah, but I've never felt restricted by any society. Also, as a kid, I was a very difficult kid because I did not comply with the general rules yeah so no but it gave me a freedom i've always felt that you have to be you know uh, uh, very conscious of who you are and of the diversity that i embody my instinct is that quite a lot of the work that you were making in theater in the 80s was in the early 90s was was really radical and quite controversial did you we were aware of that at the time i mean did you and and were you was it sort of a deliberate attempt to court controversy or were you just doing what you wanted to do and you didn't really matter yes yes it was more like i did what i thought i should do also that's one of the reasons i didn't stay in the usa uh after making desiree and i was like classmates with spike lee and ernest dickerson that i said like well the world doesn't need another American filmmaker. The world needs a filmmaker who brings the stories from the Caribbean. And that's what I want to do. I want to bring the story from the Caribbean. When I came to the Netherlands, we were hailed as the first black, how you call it, the first black uh, uh, Dutch cinema. And uh, then when we did a, a play in, in, in Dutch, they didn't know what to do with it because they said like, Ooh, you know, you're supposed to <laughs> uh, re- represent your culture. And so now you're stepping outside the culture and you're doing something with Dutch actors and actresses in Dutch. <laughs> You know, so, and then uh, one of the things I did also to, because for me, inclusion is very important. So at a certain moment, Rufus Collins had his new uh, theater company, the DNA, uh, the new Amsterdam, it was called the DNA, but um, uh, he couldn't direct the the, the opening play. So I chose to do uh, Entosake Shange's for colored girls who considered suicide when the rainbow is enough. I, we met her personally is one of the reasons we went to the U S to New York to study film and, and, and Norm and my partner uh, to study educational theater. Uh, so I said like, let, let's do that. And then I cast the 
the, the play uh, totally uh, inclusive. There were black actresses from Suriname. There were uh, black actresses from Indonesia, from Hyga from India, uh, uh, Jewish actress, uh, Dutch actresses. Because I said, like, you know, I can imagine in the U.S. it's a really a black-white thing. But I said, if you analyze these monologues, they are uh, universal. It could happen to any woman. It's not only black women that experience these things. So I did it, but uh, Entozaki wasn't happy with it. My inspiration, with my opening up the the you know the borders of, mm. of that colored girls were only like African for, uh, women with African from African descent. And returning to the quote from the beginning of the podcast, I called myself you know in the early days the colonial orgasm to make the uh, white culture conscious that I am also part of their history, of their family, even though they think I am the, an outsider and the illegitimate child. And I feel also that also in the whole aspect of the identification that I think like people with African blood but who are mixed have been sucked into the it's very dangerous to just it's understandable historically but just to identify themselves as black because it takes away the white uh, 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 importance and the white uh, uh, how do you call it uh, um, responsibility uh, of the of the of the white people who have also uh, uh, created hybrids and hybrid cultures but they don't see it as their culture they see it as that you know not their own culture but as the culture from the outsiders so i think it's very important that the outsiders claim the white culture because i had like a half german grandfather a white man and you know he he saw me always as his grandchild as part of his bloodline while, I mean, outside of the Suriname and the Antilles, where, of, of course, the, the, the racial the in, uh, uh, interconnections were much more intertwined, uh, uh, white society doesn't see me as their son or as their family. The problem is with Europe is that all the uh, hybridity during colonialism was on the other fucking side of the ocean. You know, as it was never part of their uh, proper existence and only after you know colonialism and the independence uh, in, the, in the 50s and the 60s you got the migration so the migration element is also like the outsiders coming in you know these illegitimate children coming in and god they know the dutch language and god they know the dutch history and god they know the dutch geography but you know we always thought that they weren't from us that they were the savages from the other side and especially i think like i see it in a metaphor josephine it's like you know there was a dutch family and the guy he went overseas and uh, you know he was involved in slavery and the family in holland you know they prospered from it and uh, you know he, he came back and then suddenly you know these extramarital kids from the husband they turn up and she is the, the lady europe is like devastated because it goes be uh, you know uh, it kicked against christianity against monogamy you know it's all these lies and now she has to set the table for the illegitimate children too which she won't do with much pleasure because she feels betrayed she feels betrayed the dutch nationalism feels betrayed by the uh, colonial orgasm and that they have to confront these uh, half caste half breed <laughs> hybrids who know more about them than they know, <laughs> than vice versa they have to bring the that, truth that. josephine of the of the history because the, that history has always been you know, at a table, at a Dutch table, has always been silenced and has never been spoken of. 
do you feel change is happening? The, the colonial uncles who 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 who, who, got, who made uh, uh, money and, ha- and helped to uh, uh, make the European community and life better, you know, they turn out to be some very very bad negative motherfuckers, <laughs> you know, who got statues that they that they, the kids they don't want it anymore. They don't want it anymore. And so I think the future, the children, because some of the children, the Dutch children, they start to recognize these things like, oh, we've been living a lie. We've been living a lie. We haven't been, you know, brought up with the truth of our, uh, you know. But then, of course, you have kids who just support the mother. They become really nationalistic because they think like, oh, that's going to be take things are going to be taken away from us by them. What's the um? Do you see like a do you see a way of like a future healing, like future family therapy? Can you see a way, a place that this can move on? Is it moving on? Yes, I think it's moving on. Really, I think it's moving on. I think that the, uh, as I said, that the the fusion of cultures and races and and music and dance and uh, and, and in the arts and in politics, yes, it's really. Uh, it's changing. I, I, at least in my lifetime, I've seen definitely there's uh, big changes. It's a good moment to bring in another Dutch playwright, Enver Husetik, who's part of Boom. Enver explained that so far in his writing career in the Netherlands, he's chosen to steer away from drawing on his personal family history. But this has changed for him as he's become more established. The situation is very heated at the moment. Like it's, um, the race plays a big role in the, in the public discourse and, and in a very heated way. So it's very, the landscape is pol- polarised. So it's very, it's really going on and as, as a writer I try to relate also to these things so it's a lot of um, um, input for me as a writer things I can uh, react to so I, there's a lot of interesting context for me to write and to reflect on and to relate to so I'm sort of searching as a writer how what's my position in between all these things and what can I say about it or how can I use it to write something interesting yeah and and presumably um because of your personal mixed background uh, it puts you in a privileged position to try to diffuse some of that heat you know you can you can you, you can sit in the middle in a way that many people can't yeah yeah i think so i I'm, um the play i'm working on now is uh it's i think it's yeah it's a comedy like an absurdist comedy so i'm trying to uh i'm focusing on friendship in between an older Surinese, Surinamese woman and the younger Dutch man who um, the, the men um, they do uh, a roots research together so and the white man finds out that his ancestors were slaves and the Surinamese woman find out that her ancestors were slave owners so, um, so how the question is how do they relate to that how does that change their lives and I write it as a comedy. Um, I start as a comedy, uh, but now I'm trying. In the end, it starts um, to get more um, to make it more harsh and less of a comedy. So it starts as comedy, but it's, it ends like a tragedy. But for me, it's um, I really try to um, um, stay write it as as a comedy. So focusing on the mechanisms, the, the relationships. It's about also about slavery. Um, the working title now is called Slave. So uh, I try to research these mechanisms on a, in a micro relationship. So mm. what are the power relations in in such a relationships, and how do they change in the course of the play? So I'm talking about it, but I try to do that um, not literally, but from a distance and. Uh, focusing also on details of these processes. Um, uh, maybe you can, I'm not sure if it's, maybe it's diffusing, but I don't see it now as my, I don't think it's, because before 
in the past, I, I also like to um, write and um, to create like a fuzz more or to fuse maybe more. But at the moment, I'm more try. I'm, I'm, I'm like, okay, the, the situation is already very complicated and emotional. So how can I um, take a step back and reflect on that? Because I don't think at the moment people are waiting for for more for me as a writer. I'm not. I'm not gonna. It's very easy to make uh, people more angry, I think, at the moment. So I'm trying to not, not too much to uh, make things worse than they are at the moment. I think the challenge for um, uh, both Britain and the Netherlands is aligning our self, historic self-image with our daily reality on the street. Mm-hmm. Um, and... It became. It, it is sort of, at least in the Netherlands, becoming sort of horrifically hilarious at the same time. How populist thinking is trying to get the say the self image together with borders of countries of the country and the historic white self image, um, because. The, we're we're already a very hybrid country, and the whole narrative that, um, yeah, we are here because we were there. So that whole, we need we really need to move on and and really accept it. Looking at two countries which are really, I mean, Britain is imploding in a very very particular and obvious way around Brexit. Um, but looking at two countries that are sort of just in meltdown trying to hold the millions of threads um, of the legacy of their nations. We talked about wanting to just sort of provide people with a sense of reassurance and, and essentially try and sort of like hold them through, uh, through the setting of the sun. Well, I'm, I'm very intrigued about... Um, this moment in time since it makes people in power very vulnerable and they are very vulnerable but of course people who are are in a minority position they are used of dealing with minority stress and pressure all the time and to sublimate it in something good or in a sensibility that works for them and that has a quality but for people who have been in privilege all the time it can be very threatening and also the pressure of the subject makes them maybe talk like crazy without really thinking. Um, um, but it's really weird that people who have been dealing with the minority stress on the re- have been on the receiving end of it need to console and educate and coach everybody through this stress. Um, this is really weird. I don't know what I, what I want to say with that, but I, I, I'm, I'm fascinated by this sort of re- reversed moments in time where, where people of color are c- consoling white people. <laughs> I think it's, it's interesting, isn't it? Because the consoling is a really useful word. I think in some ways, Gabriel, as I was describing with the project that we're making, in some ways it is about sort of wanting to take white people by the hand and be like, listen, you're not in charge anymore and it's going to be okay. Like, it's you're, you're suddenly powerless and confused. And from some people who have always lived like that, let us all just go on a walk and have a little sing song together. Um, I think there was something incredibly satisfying, for example, in... Um, after in the wake of George Floyd, when when Black Lives Matter conversations again came to the fore and became really prevalent, of of being able to just point to that like the decades and decades of incredibly brilliant and articulate thinking, specifically by Black American women. I think that just it um, it, it felt exciting to be able to just go, hey. Um, white organizations who have constantly tried to diversify their programming by holding outreach workshops to uh, BAME communities in which you're sort of going, hey, are you in a theater? Don't worry, we'll come and explain words to you so that you can come in and make a play that will patronize the shit out of you for. Uh, Like, it was exciting to be able to sort of slap those people a little bit and be like, look, smart people are out there, they know what they're talking, can learn from what you've done. But the consoling thing I find like I'm, I'm sort of fine actually with, um, with space being created for um, minority communities to educate and to share and hopefully to, to inspire um, people who have never had to think outside of their own cultural bubble. 
but I, yeah, again, I've, I've witnessed some really fascinating conversations like, for example, leader, a leader of an arts organisation saying I'm absolutely devastated that people are perceiving me as being racist because, you know, all of my life I've supported anti-racist causes. And I was like, but when you run an arts organisation where your entire senior and artistic staff are white, you sitting there and crying because a lot of people think that might mean that you're racist is pretty tiny violins because maybe rather than feel personally saddened that someone might think that failing to hire any black people means that you've got an issue with black people you should just interrogate why it is they think that which is probably that you've got an issue with black people and i yeah i'm quite tired of people needing to be told that they're a good person before they'll try and pull their finger out and do some good in the world wow i'm angry about that than i thought (laughs) <laughs> on a Monday morning. <laughs> uh, uh, no, it's pretty simple. I mean, I'm, I, I'm glad I have unlocked that in you, Jude, because it's your right. To, you're right to be angry about it. You're right. Can I? Can I ask you, um, uh, Gable? You were, and both of you actually, you've been talking about time. And Jude, you use that beautiful line about the setting sun of the, you know, and 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 um, holding people's hands, but particularly the setting sun time. And I, I just wanted to take cause, take Gable back particularly to to Felix and to think a little bit about how Felix has been doing this work since in the Netherlands since the 70s and I'm just interested he 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 wasn't an entirely alone voice in the 70s uh but there weren't many of there weren't many you know artists from the Dutch Antilles who were speaking out publicly on a you know on a on what some would say is a mainstream stage others would say never was mainstream enough um it's different now is it? Oh, well, maybe it's not different now. Um, but I wondered, you know, obviously you two have each other and there are others out there who are, you know, who are allies today in the way that Felix didn't have so many. Does that change the work? Does it change its power? And, um, you know, have we moved on? I'm, I'm asking lots of questions and you feel free to choose one or talk about them all. Are there differences? So let me start by saying, uh, before I went to drama school, I, I went to a sort of a year of education at the New Amsterdam, which is partly founded by people like Felix, which is a sort of way in for people of migrant, uh, uh, of of migrant population of the Netherlands into the theater. So um, they did some structural, very smart moves, but they were up against a Dutch society that said, okay, we give money for diverse theater. They they called it back then multicultural theater. And also it was sort of put in a corner by, by here's a separate budget for it. So it wasn't part of the bigger art, art budgets. Um, um, and sort of the separation of thoughts also made it um, difficult for people to end up on the stage of uh, Toneelgroep Amsterdam or like our national theater. Neska agreed. When, when I visit an opening in Amsterdam of a museum or a gallery, I'm sorry, but it's all white people. It's, it's, it's very exclusively white. So it's not so easy to, to be, how do I say it, to feel mirrored, you know, like, oh, this is about me. And I think that is always the call to... To enter a discipline is also because it calls you, because because it appeals to you, because it tells you, yeah, make me or, you know, <laughs> I'm here for you. So it's also very important, I think, for these institutions to to open their door for, for young people f- mm. from different backgrounds. And of course, not only opening the door, but also showing them people that look like them that make work that 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 refers to them and that is what felix did felix created cosmic illusion with his then partner in life and work norman de palm back in curacao and he brought it through new york city to amsterdam norman is an incredibly good producer besides being a good writer and uh, uh an actor He's a very, very good producer, and he uh, uh, built up this whole uh, possibility of getting, getting your own space with your own uh, theater and involving uh, uh, also all the other colored theater companies so that they had a venue too. I mean, it was also never 
anything that was only for uh, for Norman and me. How long how long did it last for Cosmic? How long was it well, in existence for? After Norman left, then uh, John Neerdam uh, was a director for a while, and then there was another director, and but I think it closed uh, in uh, in the nineties. It evaporated. It stopped being uh, funded, and the venue was closed. It was a hub for kind of theatre companies and arts companies of colour. Was it also for audiences too, or was it? Did it transcend? I mean, were the audiences mixed who came? How did it, how did it sort of sit? The audiences were, were were mixed, definitely, definitely. But what was very good is that we started uh, amassing a black audience. You know, because there were uh, plays and and performers that were relating to them, were related to them. So, you know, that's very important so that they feel, hey, they're they're a part of the artistic reflection of the theater. Yeah. I did one play, which uh, I did with uh, Dutch trans uh, drag queens and and, and one transsexual uh, called Marival, which was like about the suppression of gays in the Antillian society and in the Netherlands. And that one, that play was totally in Papiamento. I felt again, like, I mean, you know, the the Dutch people, if they wanted, they can come, but it was not really geared towards them. It was geared towards the enlightenment of the uh, Antillian population in, in, in the Netherlands. And it was, it was very successful. Did you have subtitles or subtitles, or was it just untranslated? No, no, it was an uh, unfunded even uh, play <laughs> <laughs> because I couldn't get subsidies for it. And people said, "Felix, do you realize that you're taking this black trash from the from the Belmer Mir and they are thieves and they are uh, uh, drug addicts and smugglers, and you're going to work with them?" Someone of your stature? I said, honey, you don't know me. <laughs> it's because they are who they are and they are so brave to be themselves. I want to honor them with this play. And I, I did a documentary on it. I, I, I did four half an hour uh, films on the whole development of how the play started because they were usually the production designers uh, for the Tropical Carnival and choosing the the Miss Carnival f- from uh, uh, Curaçao in Holland. And what I liked about them is that uh, their Miss was a, a girl from uh, Nigeria. And that was really great. They said, she's the best, I mean, you know, so. And because they said, oh, first there was also like, a, the Antillian queen must be Antillian. And, and the case, they said like, no, you know. I think she's the best. So she's from Nigeria, you know. She'll be she'll be our queen. <laughs> That's a great one of the story. Actors, he died. One of the best actors. There was a, the, the 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 quite a, a obese actor or personality. He died from an overdose of uh, cocaine that he had swallowed in the plane, and it opened up, and he died. And another one was. Uh, <laughs> Uh, went to jail because of a knife fight <laughs> he had. So, I mean, they weren't uh, sweethearts, but they were fabulous on stage. And they were yeah. very open and very honest. Ernestine Convalius came from Suriname to the Netherlands slightly later with a short spell studying in New York in the middle. She talked about her experiences of the Netherlands in the early 70s. When I came back, I became part of an organization because I was already influenced by the Black Panthers and, you know, things, even though I was young, I was 17 when I came back. But the ideas about social injustice and things like that, I was very interested in it and I wanted to be part of of the, the change. So I became part of a student organization and even though we were quite international involved, you know, the anti-Vietnam war and anti-dictatorships in Chile, etc. Uh, but we also focused on what happened to the Surinamese community. So the 70s, when the, they came, I was part of the organization who supported the community to defend themselves because racism 
you know, got a boost, <laughs> especially some fascist groups uh, in those times. They used uh, this influx of uh, yeah, well, people of color. We are all kinds of people here huh? because we are Indian descendants, Chinese descendants, etc. But and, and all of them came in huge amounts, that's true. And that was being misused to label them. So we supported, actually we started anti-racism committees. We were the first to start uh, on a national level anti-racist campaigns and, and, and organized also political parties and, and other groups to uh, confront those uh, attacks, yes. Inspired by Felix, Norman and Rufus Collins, she established her own theatre, the Bima Park Theatre, in the very neighbourhood where Felix had cast Marival. My main goal was also to make sure that people would become acquainted with what is happening in the, in the mainstream, that, you know, uh, especially the kids, because I think kids have to develop their own things, what they love and like, their own taste of what art is. But for especially the adults, it was important to start representing them in the organization, because when I started 20 years ago, it was in a white organization. So uh, for me, the first move to be able to connect with the people around me was the, the representation. So that's what I worked on. And with the representation, you also uh, start to, to hear their stories. And we were not producing ourselves, but we were producing um, festivals. And we were also encouraging others to start making professional theater plays or music or spoken word, you know, all the different performing arts. Uh, in the beginning, we didn't have that much, much choice. Uh, we were a re representing organization. Now it has changed, of course, because in the meanwhile, we have our old talent programs. Uh, we have also a program for professionals who came from the academy, but of course they are bicultural. They don't find a, a, an own place, that, that an own house. So we have become a house for them. <laughs> No one say bye, no one say bye, I borrow me. I buy a piao, 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 we go make me loud. Piao, piao, piao. Back to Jude and Gable. The feeling of not belonging or of slightly being on the outside or of, of sometimes having a kind of left field view of stuff generally feels like I would rather have that than be someone who was brought up in a way which obviously doesn't apply to everyone else in the arts, uh, but in a way that was monocultural or um, to sort of feel like I was always part of the kind of dominant hegemony. And speaking of someone like Felix de Roy, who is truly, I think, in the Netherlands, in the context of the Netherlands, a, a, a legend of a sort of hybrid perspective on the arts, since he's also a fine artist. Uh, he made films and he sort of single-handedly founded together with Norman de Palm and, and Rufus Collins, a sort of segment of the cultural diverse theater in the Netherlands. Everybody's identity in this colonial history, in all those colonial histories, are very um, specifically produced. So everybody is born on a very specific intersection with produces other traditions and other perspectives. Um, but our general cultures, wants us as artists in a clear box while or our identities uh, or, or label our, our identities in a clear way while we are very sort of hybrid in, in our approach and in our, our perspective. And I, I think it's very interesting that someone like Felix de Roy who lived in a very Dutch Caribbean colonial uh, sphere and yeah, he made he sort of combined um, Genet's, uh, the maids with local, with local expressions and local hierarchies. And he, I heard him speak the other day on a, on a, on a, 
on a podcast of the Dutch Theatre Festival. And he, he tells the story that when he started film school in, in, in New York City and he was in the, in the class with Spike Lee, that he couldn't mingle fa- very well with the sort of American or uh, Afro-American black experience in the sense that they were very clear-minded about about hierarchies and, and boundaries between groups. While for him being on a, growing up on a small Dutch Caribbean island, things were much more hybrid than mixed. So um, um, he couldn't go on producing his work in New York. So it it gives pressure to not have a clear label, but it's also uh, um, sometimes a blessing. I asked Felix about this New York experience. It's easier to be part of a of a, of a community that accepts you as their offspring than to be part of a community that denies you of being their offspring. That's the whole psychological game, <laughs> you know. Mm-hmm. You're gonna go to the family that that welcomes you because it said, oh, you're also are from African descent. That even if it's only if you're whether you're a mulatto or a quadroon or an octoroon, that doesn't matter because the black code already classified you like that. And that was my whole issue with the in the U.S. and in the world. I said, like, why do you still? honor the classifications that were given in the black code. I mean, if you're an octoroon, is it crazy what they're gonna do? You you, you re- relieve the whole white community of their responsibilities. Right. <laughs> but it's not always that they, uh, that this is well accepted what I say, because I say like, oh, uh, Spike Lee also said like, oh, this is the, uh, you're uh, uh, an example of the uh, tragic mulatto who cannot make a choice. You know, you don't. He doesn't know where his priorities or his loyalties are, and he can shift his priorities and he can shift his loyalties, which is also, of course, a very racist view embedded in a racist society uh, that, that says, like, you know, we can we cannot fuse. If you fuse, it's, it's going to be a disaster because you're going to be lost in your identity. You you won't be accepted by either side and if you start to believe in that bullshit yeah you're lost felix sent me his fantastic autobiography ego documenta showing his artistic work across the art forms nesca is as fluid in her arts practice as felix i asked her about it i've been thinking about it a lot why in the african diaspora people seem to 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 move easily or more easily in between the disciplines I think it has to do with a Eurocentric way of, of, of sort of rule that you should choose for one thing. But since we are most of the time not consisting out of one thing, we are multi-racial already the way we're born. It's at least I think that has to do with with all the disciplines. And and what I also see a lot is that a lot of the people that I know who write started out started on stage. So the oral tradition plays a major fact in that. And of, of course, in in um, in uh, Felix um, Felix uh, story, he's also a, a visual storyteller, true film yeah. and visual arts, which is amazing. I've always till now, I've been a little bit marginalized because they don't know what to do with me. <laughs> you know, Josephine, am I a visual artist? Am I a, a, a stage director? Am I a film director? Am I a curator? Uh, you, you know, where, how are you going to pinhole me? So that's, they, they really didn't know what to do with me. And when the book came out, it went, it was sent to all the television programs, talk shows, uh, radios, uh, uh, news, newspapers, and Josephine, nobody reacted on it. Nobody, not one interview, nothing, 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 mm. nothing, nothing. I'm sorry, Felix. It's really, to me, it was a beautiful and um, impressive, extraordinary work of art to see that book. So I thank you for sharing it with me. And it really, I was very moved to read it at the weekend. I'm sorry that other people haven't yet. Can can I ask you this? Can I can I ask you this thing though? I because I, 
Presumably, you were very comfortable being an artist and a sculptor and a playwright and a director. That's your who you are, right? Yes, yes. I mean, I can't do everything at the same time, but I'm very glad also that in my survival, I've been able to survive because, I mean, if I don't get a job in a certain discipline, a job in another discipline, you know, might pop up. Like, you know, I'm not really an actor, but they asked me for a part in this film that is going to open up the Dutch Film Festival, the 25th. Felix is, is a hero. And um, what I wrote two years ago also about him is that, you know, the black face, black Pete, finally, 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 we're coming at this point that, that people start to realize that it's not okay to use black face and black Pete in these days. And I wondered, why didn't they hear Felix when he was already saying these things 30 years ago? Why didn't they hear him? And my, my partner with whom I wrote these this letters, she had no answer to that. She was at that time, she was, um, she was the head of the theater in the same street where Norman and Fe Felix, it's a street, it's called Ness, like my name in Amsterdam, the Ness, it's a street with theaters. Mm. And, and she also said, yeah, we, we, we accepted them, we tolerated them, but maybe we didn't really we didn't really see them as serious artists because, of course, of the white gays made that the sort of theater they made was different than theirs. So it was kind of accepted and tolerated, but not really appreciated. Don't, don't underestimate the, the power of the white gays, the master narrative on art. So all the critics, all the playwrights, all the directors, all the, all the repertoire was measured in uh, the quality standards that measure them is, is the white gaze, it's the master narrative. So, so these two guys out of Curaçao made art, made theater, which was totally different. And at the same time that uh, what the Dutch don't um, appreciate is a person of color who's not impressed. Mm. They get extremely annoyed by that. Yeah. So I think that for him also served as a problem within the Dutch environment. It was a catalyst in some ways, I imagine, to be in, to, but, but, but was it also, how, how did it hold him back, that problem? It may have, and I think that the exhibition he made, uh, Beethoven Swart, was uh, fallen in the eye of, uh, of art uh, critics, etc., etc. You know, because in the Netherlands, um, there was for a very long time, and even still today is, that art is supposed to be art for art's sake. It should not have a political message or pol politics ingrained into it. So if you make art, or you make exhibitions that are politically engaged, that means that the established art environment is not too happy with you and they will try and keep you out. Mm. Right? So this is the Dutch, uh, the Dutch environment. I don't know how it is in Britain, but you know, in Britain you do political art. I know you do, but here now we're not having it. No. So what you see now is that with the young artists, uh, young such as myself, I'm not that young, <laughs> but <laughs> the artists starting after 2000, so to speak, making work that is political, it's very problematic. We don't get shows. We don't get uh, into exhibitions. Um, and it's only like in the past, I think maybe 10 years, that this is kind of picking up. But then it's a niche within a niche. Because... As in, you mean, you mean there are certain galleries or there are certain curators who are open to it? Yeah, well, not even. You know, all the, all the museums will do the obligatory exhibition once in every two years with people of color, yeah? So they've done their diversity thing, so to speak. But there's no... Um, it's very hard to gain a foothold that is strong 
very often you have to open your own doors. You have to create your own doors. You have to kick against some doors and some doors will remain closed, but some doors will, will open. I think that's more or less in a certain moment you get a, uh, uh, how you call it? <laughs> they start to listen. And sometimes it, it, it's, you know, very often, I mean, the society li listens too late to uh, uh, prophets and prophet prophetesses. But for example, uh, that someone like Angela Davis would become the cover girl for Vanity Fair, you know, I think like, well, baby, as they would say, we've come a long way. Because first she was like the, the, the terrorist, the woman you couldn't deal with. Uh, you know, she was the enemy. And now she's seen as an icon. So I do think things change, yes. But sometimes it takes very long before you get acknowledged. And sometimes a lot of things are have been destroyed before the acknowledgement comes so that you have a lot more to, in the recon it takes more time to reconstruct everything again. Felix is not recognized as one of our great artists. He's recognized in the margin. That, that's it. It's simple as that. And, 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 and to go kind of to interrogate that further, is that, is that simply on account of his, of his history and his, his color, color of his skin? Or is there something about the fact that he never sought to be part of the mainstream? I don't know, you should ask him that. I think he did his best to become part of the mainstream. But becoming part of the mainstream art world in the Netherlands is quite the task. So if you do not play by the rules, it's not gonna happen. And the rules are there and they are invisible. And I think that uh, someone like Felix knows the rules perfectly well. And I think that he deliberately chose not to play by the rules which is, you know, great. Because within the black arts environment, he is recognized as the great forefather. Was he, was he inspirational for you? In his, uh, how do you say it? Um, durf, what's the word in English? In his, um, uh, how do you say that? He's not bothered. He's like, I'm going that direction and I'm moving anyway. So you see what you're doing, if you're coming or not, but I'm going. So that for me is uh, very inspirational. He just chose his own path. And there's also an amnesia going on in the sense that people of color who are now at drama schools sort of always get the feeling that they're by the sort of audition process that they're very special and they're sort of exoticized in a weird way, like they were the first. So there's an amnesia, like there's different waves of theater artists of color in the Netherlands because the country has colonized the whole world for hundreds of years, but every time everybody starts anew. And that is a very weird thing. So what we're trying to do now at the moment, we have uh, started an organization called The Need for Legacy with, I think, 30 artists of colonial descent of other bicultural backgrounds. And what we try to do is really change the curriculum at drama schools and talk with the Performing Arts Archive to really not once in a few years start a new wa wave of very, ah, let's look at diverse theater, but very... Um, do it all the time and and fight the amnesia. And um, I think someone as Felix has really been done, I don't, maybe harm is a big word, but he has been um, not valued by our theatre system by putting him in a corner. For instance, when he made, in the 90s, shows around uh, queers of colour, of course, it is now a subject where this, which is very trendy and every big theater is picking up queers of color. But when he was making those shows in the 90s, he couldn't get the budget for it. And of uh, uh, um, a documentary about his sort of documentary theater about queers of color in Amsterdam is now a sort of 
becoming sort of legendary thing and all young theatre makers are watching that documentary. So he is, um, and, and and the Dutch Film Festival is opening a, a big film about Curaçao where he's playing a big bear, big lead role in. So he ha- he's having a cultural moment now, but it's long overdue and he, and he doesn't get the mainstream credit he deserves. So in a bigger, um, of course, we are still having a cultural Black Lives Matter moment, but we're also trying to sort of do justice to history and theater history at the moment. And I think uh, Felix is very much on the deserving part of it. And I hope he he um, uh, gets the place as the icon that he really is to the Dutch theater. It has been an unbelievable privilege to have spoken to Ernestine, Charles, Nesca, Enver, Jude, Gable, Jonathan, and of course, Felix over the last few weeks. Their insights were so powerful. This podcast could easily have been far longer to have done justice to their contributions. And I look forward to watching and reading the six plays that come from the Boom Project to hear more of some of their voices. We've incorporated the occasional few bars for in the Surinamese singer Max Wojcicki through the project. Max worked between the Netherlands and Suriname in the mid-20th century. Ernestine Spimer Park Theatre recently created a hugely successful musical inspired by him and his story. We'll play out the podcast with the full track, Piao Piao. The team behind the Dash Arts podcast is me, Josephine Burton, Christina Catalina and Natalie Beach. You can find more episodes wherever you get your podcast or by going to our podcast section on our website, dasharts.org.uk. If you like the Dash Arts podcast, please follow the show, share and leave us a review. It helps us stay visible and would mean the world to us. I'm Josephine Burton. Back soon with more conversations at the Dash Arts podcast. Thank you for listening. No one say bye, no one say bye, I borrow me. I buy a piao, 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 we go make me loud. Piao, 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 we go make me loud. Piao, 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 we go make me loud. We got me da ben ya, borrow ya.